the Sloppy Lab. I am JT Russell, and here tonight with the man who got one up on Quick Draw 3456, it's Quick Draw 3457. <laughs> uh, thank you. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday, indeed. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. 3456 was really getting me. I had to, I had to put him in his place, <laughs> and I did. Some some I, I like to imagine there's a quick draw three four five six on the internet somewhere that sees you around and just like oh got me <laughs> that guy that guy again <laughs> I know nice uh, you guys come up with some great jokes about my my random numbers I have at the end mm -hmm. I enjoy that oh I heard an excellent one about uh, JDG our teammate uh, on the NKFL server they were saying uh, that they had to fight uh, face the Face the, the the guy who has a name that looks like a Swedish uh, a license plate or something. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what his numbers are. Um, uh, three fourteen. I gotta go look. Mm -hmm. Three fourteen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean that looks like that does look like a license plate. I could see that. Yeah. Uh, for 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 a hot minute, I thought maybe uh, JDG was a big fan of um, the original Mission Impossible. You remember that? Where. Uh, Job three fourteen was a uh, a pivotal a pivotal clue and plot point uh, MacGuffin, as it were. <laughs> Did not remember that. I mean, it's been how many years since that movie came out? Many, many indeed. Yeah, many indeed. Well, cool. Well, so, um, this is a, a casual way for us to start an episode about being competitive, or or not, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not being competitive. Maybe. Yeah, um, so we're here tonight. We're going to chat about um, competitive play, competitive nature of Keyforge and games um, versus casual. What is the difference? What does it mean here? Um, I think it's going to be pretty interesting. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting topics that we're going to touch on here. Um, and I'm very curious because like, this is a very... Before I heard other perspectives on this, I hadn't really even considered them. So like, for me, when I first started hearing about other people that had different ideas of competitiveness in Keyforge... Um, you know, it was really it was really cool to hear some other perspectives. So this is going to be really interesting. And for anyone watching, we definitely also want to hear what you might have to say about this too, and where you land as far as competitive versus casual, and, and what it means to you. So um, some pretty cool stuff. Um, just a couple minor announcements to start. Um, last week we um, we I think last week was our matchup in the Swindle Doppelganger, right? Or was it the mm -hmm. week before that? It was the week before that, maybe. Yeah, yeah, week yeah. before. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are both currently tied for, I guess, first place, maybe third. I don't know. It depends on how the points go. We are uh, four, one, and zero oh, each of our teams, which is great. We have one more week left to play. Um, we we are playing the team that defeated you last week for your first loss of the season. So mm -hmm. we are we are here to to get some vengeance for you for sloppy. We'll be be cheering you cheering you anxiously for that for that revenge that sweet sweet revenge. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Um, originally the plan for tonight's episode um, obviously we always play each other in a game but our plan tonight was to actually stream uh, my teammate JDG's matchup against Aviator for the Swindle team event they ended up having to bump their matchup a couple hours they already played they played to a 1-1 tie um, so we didn't get to stream that so you and I are going to play a game as we always do so mm -hmm. um, should be fun should be fun yeah glad that glad that it got in it was a uh... I caught the tail end of I guess the second the second game. Um so it looked looked pretty cool. Love seeing love seeing JDG play that that one deck that I don't know if he'd want us to spoil, but you know the deck I mean. <laughs> it's it's probably a pretty complex deck to play, I would think. It it's, it's super complex. Mm -hmm. Probably. <laughs> um well, speaking of JDG again, he's making um the news in both of our announcements here. Uh you two are matched up in your NKFL round. Mm -hmm, mm hmm so we'll i'm sure we'll i'm sure we'll stream that one or, or i'll stream that one um but yeah looking forward to play jdg uh this week uh for nkfl uh in what promises to be a very competitive sweaty uh sloppy on sloppy violent match <laughs> as uh, fighting lately yeah lots of infighting as uh as he and i do our very best to join our um our polish all-stars in the upper divisions so <laughs> Yeah. You guys are in silver at the moment. We're in silver, fighting for, uh, fighting for those uh, gold berths. Um, yeah. You know, I went into gosh, the last two rounds of NKFL were brutal for me. I um, I was uh, 
in a very, very, what I thought comfortable, uh, first for the, for the pod. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I had a two, two rounds where I got, I don't know, outmaneuvered in the bidding and then outplayed in the games. And I'm now kind of trying to scrap some wins together to make sure that I can, uh, stay in the advancement portion of the standings. So the top three players in the pod, I believe advanced to gold. And then the fourth goes to a playoff for a potential fourth, uh, seat to advance. Um, JDG, I think, has actually taken the first place uh, position in our pod. So, congrats. And Practice. I'll be looking to yeah. claw some of that ground back this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, actually, not tonight played her match today against Jay Philippeg. And she got a 3 0 sweep today, which was she did. a huge match. I mean, I got to watch some of those games. And uh, once again, she played Rector like a champ. I like, mm -hmm. It's amazing when you think about this format. Um, and you, we've had an episode about this before. You can check out the old video and the discussion on that with JDG. Um, how you really see like the best of the best decks come out. And you're always playing against Fire, especially in Gold and Silver. And she plays Rector. And it's a deck that has like one or maybe two cards of Amber Control, if you count um, Cutthroat Research. It's like a 71 Saz, something like that. And it just, mm -hmm. like, it doesn't stop. That deck is just, <laughs> in, in her hands, is just unbelievable. Um it is in every single game. I've I've never seen that deck blown out before. Yeah, is you know very strong. She pilots it so well. You talk about enjoying watching folks play the decks that they play well. You know, I, I love watching JDG play play Chandra. I love watching Not Tonight play Rector. Um, always always excellently piloted. Always always well done. And Jay yeah. Philippeg is no slouch. Walking away with a win against Jay Philippeg yeah. in any amount is a good day. So a, a three zero win. Uh, hats off to Not Tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we're talking about NKFL. Um, let me ask you. So when you are playing your NKFL matches, um, it's a pretty competitive league. Do you go into the match? You feel nervous? Do you like? How do you how do you approach it? Like, is it still feel casual to you, or do you see it as like, uh, I really got to win these games? Mm, I I definitely do approach it as a com uh, as a competitive league. Um, there are some matches which I'll do more prep for than others. Um, and that may depend on my own lineup, may not. Um, I don't know, uh, no n nerves per se. There is definitely, there's definitely a feel of, uh, uh, well, I think the, uh, the kind of advancement and, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 uh what, what do I want to say? A promotion and uh, relegation, I don't know, <laughs> uh, nature of the, their ladder system uh, adds a little bit of, a, of an edge for the competitively inclined. Um, so there is a little bit of like, a, oof, really want to make sure I can uh, be moving up to the next the next draw or stay in the top one if you happen to be there. Um, so that's, that's actually um, kind of a really cool element. Um, and I guess yeah. you could say a little bit of nerves. Sure, sure. Yeah. I get nervous <laughs> for events like that. I'm not in the NKFL, but yeah, for sure. Like even ABR, ABR is like a super casual uh, league, and everyone's there to have fun. And you know, you still run into good decks, but I still, you know, I don't always get nervous when I play those games. But like some of the the top tables for ABR, like yeah, I, I definitely can feel it. Mm -hmm. um, Swindle team event and all the Swindle events, I, I definitely feel it as well. Um, more so in same day tournaments. Like the Swindle used to run these same day tournaments. They had like a Dark Tidings only tournament. Um, when it, when the set came out, I definitely like you feel the pressure in same day tournaments because you don't really have the time to mentally prepare between matches, and um, you know you're going from one game to the next sometimes if your if your game goes long and you don't really have a time to take a breather and um, definitely can feel the nerves. Um, I consider myself a competitive player. Um, we're going to talk a bit about like what does that mean. Um, I, you know, one word that comes to mind for me as well is like try hard, and I think they're very different things. Um, I don't feel like I uh, like I'm a try hard in this game. I just feel like um, competitively, I always want to win. And you know, my wife actually, um, my wife always tells me I'm too competitive with games, <laughs> and it's not just KeyForge; it's like anything. And um, she's not a like competitive player she enjoys playing games just casually like very simple games nothing that's like too complex and like if i sit there and like go into the tank to try to think about like what's the best play here like it she gets bothered by that she's just a different kind of gamer um mm -hmm. 
But for me, it's not about like, I don't ever think to myself, I have to beat this person. It is purely like internal to me. I, I want to be the best that I can at something. And if I make a mistake, I'm not mad because I lost to you. I'm mad because I didn't play as well as I could have. And I think that's a bit different than maybe some other people like consider competitive nature. Like my wife thinks that I always just want to like beat everyone to the ground and win games. And it's not like that at all. Um, so there are definitely different types of competitive players. Obviously, there's different types of competitive and casual players, but there's like a lot of layers, I think, to like what it means to be competitive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, I thought we were going to come at maybe maybe slightly different um, definitions here, but I would 100% define myself as a competitive player, um, though I would have also said that my competitiveness is uh, inwardly focused. Um, so... I I always do approach games, key, you know, key forge not being an exception of okay, I'm I'm here trying to win. I'm going to play my best in a situation. Like uh, I I typically don't get you know upset at a, a loss, but I'm more motivated to like I'm always motivated to improve, right? I'm definitely more disappointed in the result that you know I'd I'd rather I'd rather lose a game where I felt like I played well or at least learn something about the game or about my play than win one and be like, I got nothing out of that in terms of growth as a player or, or like I made lots of mistakes, but still my decks carried me. Like that's a less satisfying result. Mm -hmm. It would still be personally unsatisfied if I like play well and lose for whatever reason. I, I do get upset about that. Um, but it's a really good point about like what, you know, what could you have done differently? Try to take a lesson from it. Um, you know, I always, if I if I feel like I lost because of a bad draw or something like that, I still try to look back and think, like, were there any, like, small decisions I thought at the time were right, but in hindsight didn't make sense? And, um, like, you know, just try to think about that kind of stuff. And as opposed to blaming luck, I try to just always take a lesson from it, like you said, and mm -hmm. see if there's something that I could have done differently. Um, and then kind of, like, you know, comes back to myself. Like, I should have, you know... I expected myself to be better than that, or maybe next time I'll I'll be better than that. Um, but you said that you're a similar gamer in other games too. Is it's not different for KeyForge? Um, uh, <laughs> there are definitely games where where I I would say okay, this is this is more of a competitive uh, more of a casual outlet, social outlet than necessary an outlet for comp like a competitive outlet. Um, they're probably not games that I'm playing a a ton of or as as regularly um and i think that any time that i'm sitting down even if it's even if this is like okay the the beer is here the pretzels here you know we're all we're all just kind of like laughing having a good time we're not like busting out the uh i don't know the, s the strategic best playbooks or what, what whatever you bust out when you're like really in uh competitive mode um you know i'm i'm thinking through the best play and if i'm not kind of thinking through the best play i'm i'm maybe not having as much fun um so uh I'm, I'm not kicking myself in the shins if i'm losing but i'm probably also mostly enjoying the time if i'm if i'm kind of approaching it that way uh in, in a way where i'm trying to like put the play the best game that i can play right yeah and so for anyone watching again just i would love to hear from you guys if you consider yourselves competitive players if our definition here of competitive kind of lines up with what you think too um so just let us know in the chat i'm very interested to hear what others think um mm -hmm. we were talking before about like what is the normal audience um for for this show as well like do we normally get competitive players here or casual players here i'm you know i'm not sure i'm interested to hear um the tco definitions are something else that i always think of when we talk about competitive and casual because the T tco definitions i think are like very weirdly worded um and they do not align to what i consider to be competitive and casual um i see you're going to pull them up here like mm -hmm. there's just certain things that like the way that they kind of explain it and they're doing it because they don't want people to go into these games um and you know get something out of it that they didn't expect so they put this definition in here to try to um you know reduce the number of times someone like goes into a game and like quits partway through because it's not the experience they were looking for um but the way they define this, so you have this up here now for casual, uh, assumes you're familiar with the interface, and uh, it says, like, breaks are expected. 
uh, informal and laid back. Um, take backs are allowed too. Like I, I don't know, like all of that to me, um, it, it almost makes it sound like you're just like doing something else while you're playing a casual game, and like that's not really what I would consider casual. Um, but I don't know. Like I'm not really a casual player, so I'm curious what other people say. Um, Data Forge Dream says they're both. So, um, like, does does this casual definition align with your expectations, Data Forge Dream? I'm I'm curious to hear that. And then the competitive one. There's something else in the competitive one that I thought was kind of odd as well. Um, prompt play with no excessive away from keyboarding or rules errors. Um, I see, like, in all of my Keyforge competitive games in TCO, like, and when I say competitive, I mean just, like, in the competitive queue, not, like, a tournament game. Um, there's a lot of times where you, like, have to stop and think about what to what to play. It's not really, like, away from keyboard, but it's, you know, still, like, taking a pause to think through the best play. To me, that should be expected in competitive, um, whereas in casual, it should not be. And then rule errors, you know, that's tough to say, like, the rules enforced system, but, like, I always see people say like, oh, I made a mistake. Can I undo it? And I would almost always say yes to that in like a regular competitive game on TCO because I am there to like face the best competition I can. And if someone makes like a misclick or a small mistake and they realize it right away, then I'm robbing myself of an opportunity at a more competitive experience. So to me, like, I don't really agree with this definition here saying like, you know, you shouldn't have take backs or you shouldn't have rule errors, you know, things like that. I, I want to play against the best that I can. And if that means they need to think for a few minutes or if that means they need to take something back, then that's fine. Let's do it. Mm, interesting. Interesting. And yeah, good uh, good comments from both uh, DataForge and Zotted here. Um, you know, kind of saying, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a mix uh, that folks are bringing uh, to the table and maybe there's an element of kind of m meeting your opponent where they are. So I'm going to, I'm going to say, you know, absolutely. Let's, let's draw some, some bounds around kind of the situations we're talking about, you know, on the one hand, if you're introducing a brand new player to the, to the game, you're probably not, you know, going guns blazing, uh, uh, um, in, in any respect. Um, and then there's also the kind of the vault tour style event where you're sitting down in, in what's assumed to be the most kind of competitive environment there is. Um, but yeah, getting back to getting back to the definitions here, I have to appreciate that there is like uh that there's the TCOs in sort of an, an odd spot, right? Like they have these cues, which may, may not even be the best buckets to have presented to folks. Um, Cause they're obviously trying to avoid this notion of like competitive decks versus competitive players. And like uh, they're trying to provide these shorthands for essentially social contracts. Um, that folks are going to expand differently, right? So if I say, and that's kind of what we're talking about, right? Like if I say to you, hey, let's play a casual game, that's going to mean something different to you than to me. And they're taking a stab at at presenting it here. And I think what you're, what you're highlighting too, right, is I don't think that most folks expand that those definitions in the same way that's been presented. And I, and I don't think that... Uh, um, uh, even folks heed <laughs> these definitions uh, uh, anyway, because <laughs> uh, you yeah. know it's very common to hear folks say, "Oh, they they brought their '80s as deck to uh, to casual." Like it's not exactly. part of the definition. I, I don't I don't know, and that's that's kind of the counter argument. Um, um. <laughs> yeah, um, players on TCO have kind of already defined casual and competitive as being SAS based, right? Like, I feel like seventy five SAS and above has to be played in competitive, and. Um, you can play whatever you want in competitive, no one cares, but in casual, you know, like you can't go above a certain point. Maybe it's even 70. I'm not really sure. Um, but like, is there a way to decouple that and to like properly redefine these categories? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because, you know, like you said, like people don't really like take these definitions and follow them. You know, they have their own construct that they've already made about this is a, this deck is too strong for casual, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't think there is a clean one word definition that or one word label that you can provide that's going to make folks really align on expectation here. I think the best you can do and I've I've seen, you know, and again another shout out to our uh, not tonight, you know, is um is provide a little bit more information in your game's title, right? So 
we'll do things like, hey, I'm looking to play against a monster. Here's the password. And then, you know, even if it's in, uh, even if it's in competitive, like, you know, like bring some heat. Like I'm not just here to like, um, I'm not just here to, to have a sweaty game. I also want to face a really, a really high powered deck. And uh, another, <laughs> another uh, uh, interesting comment from from Zada saying that they always play in comp, no matter what, to avoid yeah. has drama. Like I am one hundred percent in this camp. I will bring my spicy sixty three saz to comp or or whatever the number um, be uh, because I'd I'd rather err on that side uh, than on the other side. And so apologies if you're out there screaming at me for playing underpowered decks in comp. <laughs> But I, I think I anyone know. is though. Like I, I think in comp, there's just you know, unless it's like you're playing a truly bad deck and it doesn't even put up a fight, I don't think anyone cares. You know, like and even then they're like, oh well, I won. You know, like they probably shouldn't have played that deck in comp, but I don't think they really care that much. Um, it, it's kind of a one-way street. I feel. I have with casual versus competitive. So this is not fair because it's only happened once. But once I had someone before before uh, we hit the start game button say like. Hey buddy, I'm looking to play against competitive decks. <laughs> like, will you please leave? <laughs> what were you playing? I gotta see that. Oh well, this is. Uh, I, I actually I remember this well because I was playing uh, Green Wasp, uh, which oh, wow. I believe punches well above its uh, its SAS number, which is 67. I may have been lower at the time, but I mean, come on, you can't look at a double tribute, double six semper deck and say like hey take this to the casual queue like this doesn't belong <laughs> you know that they were just looking at the saz though oh right? absolutely like, absolutely yeah. yeah well because and um i'm proud to this... say mm -hmm. no sorry. sorry i was just gonna just toot my own horn for a second here um i have brought a 48 i think 47 or 48 saz deck to competitive before and won with it and it was like the greatest moment for me like i, I love that deck it's just like a coda <laughs> Tox, triple toxin discard deck um and just like tons of disruption like that and i was playing against like some 80 something world's collide deck and i was able to win and i was like that's it i'm good you know like i <laughs> mission accomplished here um i have never got a comment when i play that one in competitive um no one ever said to like turn around and go back to casual with that mm-hmm mm -hmm. I I can say too. I, I I witnessed those those games. So you played two games, uh, if I remember right. So the first game, and this was not against the slouch deck either. This was a very highly Strong rated deck, deck in the '90s. I want to say. Um, no, I don't know if it was that high. It was high though. It was a good deck. It was yeah. a good player. They were a good sport about it. Um, they they lost game one. They asked for a rematch, and I graciously <laughs> accepted it. And they they beat my butt game two. So I think actually they might have beat me game three as well. I'm not sure if we had a third one, but. Um, yeah, it was, it was a good deck. <laughs> it is a good deck. A doomy, a true doomy. Um, and I, I want to say even in game, even in game two, like you did lose, but you were in it. It wasn't like, uh, you had no outs from the start, from the get go. Like, uh, yeah. it was a game. I think, game, I think game two was close. And if there was a game three, I'm not remembering at this point, but if there was, it was not close. I think it like progressively, you know, like once he figured out what my deck was doing, it was like, okay, we're not going to fall for that one again. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah you don't get to have these three toxins i'm sorry quick draw <laughs> yeah, three toxins two ember imps two hysteria and a rise uh i think a succubus maybe and then there's like three inspirations two inspirations uh a mantle of the zealot so like you can always play use the toxins no matter what um <laughs> it's a blast i love it very cool um anyway so let's get back to competitive decks um so uh, I guess there was another question you had here we were talking about before is, um, is there such a thing as a competitive deck and is there such a thing as a casual deck? Mm -hmm. You want to talk about that a bit? Yeah. Um, I, well, certainly if we, if we looked at the TCO definitions by those definitions, the answer would be no. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I, I totally agree with that. I think there are decks that are harder to justify bringing probably harder to justify bringing to casual against a random person than uh, to competitive. Um, you know, I think if you're, if you're approaching the game competitively, uh, as, <laughs> as that may be ill-defined Ill or not, um, then you could probably justify taking about anything to competitive. Um, but, you know, uh, the decks that I would put in this camp are probably some of the uh, more potent 
less interactive Coda decks out there. Uh, I'm looking at you. Uh, where's my Coda combo grieve? Um, bum, 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 bum. He who slices the gully. He who slices the gully. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of a pile of pips um, and looking to race and steal. Um, uh, I, I mean, it's it's not not really a, a beer and pretzels type of deck, at least in in my view of it. But you know, that's that's my view of it. I I could imagine bringing this deck to play a casual game with a friend. Um, I think I would have a harder time justifying to myself bringing this to the casual queue on TCO, and and expecting a random person to be cool with playing a game labeled casual against it. Yeah, yeah. I think when you're playing in person, it's definitely a different experience and it's going to depend on who you're playing too. Like I have some friends who, um, I just know they have a smaller collection, so I'm not going to bring, you know, super powerful deck in a casual game with them. I have other friends who have a huge collection and even if we're just hanging out and playing games on a Friday night, I'm going to bring whatever I want, you know, like some of my best decks. And, um, so I, I guess it's kind of like knowing your, know the room as well. Um, read the room and, you know, um, there's definitely, you know, if I'm playing in a in a local event with like you know four to six of us at, at our store, like we used to do back in the good old days, we haven't done that in a while. Um, I'm gonna bring something that's like middle to high because like I, I am a competitive person, so I, I want to win, but I also don't want to just bring something that was like the best deck I own to play with these four people who own like 30 decks, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so like it's you know it's partially about reading the room, and um, but I still have that like desire in me to want to win so i'm not just gonna like bring you know a week 60 something deck that i know isn't very good but it's fun because i still want to win you know like even at like the local store level i still want to i still want to win i still want to have the master vault updated with a few extra chains for myself um (laughs) you know that kind of stuff still matters to me i would i would absolutely rather have the i would always rather have the weaker deck um in a matchup from a kind of competitive satisfaction standpoint um, I don't know. I think there's something about rolling into a matchup and being like, oh, I, I should win this on paper. Uh, almost feels like, uh, I don't know. It almost feels like there's more to be, there's more to be gained by scr- in scratching that competitive itch when you feel like you are the underdog. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, for a, a long while, my collection was still like mostly underdogs compared to a lot of the best decks that were out there, like in in tournaments. So I still I definitely felt that, and there was a lot of pride in in myself and in my deck whenever it would win because I knew it was technically underdog and people wouldn't consider it like a top tier deck, but it you know it can win anyway. Like Zod had said, it's the beauty of Keyforge; any deck can win, mm-hmm. um, even if it's a lesser one. Then I definitely feel like some bonus points to myself for winning this with, with an underdog, definitely. But there's there's a flip side of that too, which is being able to identify the deck that's going to give you the best chance for an event or in in the meta if there if there is one, right? Uh, so you might say like, I mean, uh, let's take Aslan here, right? Aslan is probably a great AOA uh, AOA example of not a very casual deck, right? It's it's looking to do brig things and it's looking to do lots of brig things, and and maybe. You know, some folks would 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 enjoy that casually, but um, uh, uh, where was I going with this comment? Um, I lost my train of thought. I mean, I, I think that that's a different way to look at like casual versus competitive. Like, this is a kind of deck that doesn't let you play Keyforge, doesn't let your opponent play Keyforge. Hmm. So, um, it's obviously very strong. But if I'm playing against that, I feel like I am doing something completely different than if I were playing against a different like straight up type of deck. I think combo decks kind of have that feeling of like, that's not a casual deck, but um, I'm not sure maybe Lorian here that you have up there. You've been playing that one a lot lately. It's not really a combo deck per se. It's like got the double gang or not, obviously, and the might makes right. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's more of like a straight up deck, even though it's very strong. You could play that in a casual sense because at least your opponent feels like they're playing Keyforge. Mm, we should play more games with Lorian. <laughs> uh, you you kicked my butt with that one many times last week. It is a um, great a great jank deck for the ABR fans out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, 
Have you played your AVR match this week yet? I have not. I have not. Okay. Well, leave the mystery then. Maybe you're not playing Morian. Maybe you're playing something else. Could be. Could be. It's a contender. It's a contender. But I mean, uh, it's a lot of the a lot of the the top end AOA probably falls into that camp. I mean, Heart of the Forest, um, like Double Martian Generosity, may be harder to make the case for for casual uh, play. Though, yeah. I think there are there yeah. are very likely some, you know, very cool Martian Generosity decks that are purely casual, or at least very very justifiably casual. Um, maybe Double Martian Generosity, Hypnotic Command, mm, Gold Key Imp, <laughs> less so much, <laughs> but. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. maybe not as much. Maybe not um, as much. You know, you were talking earlier about competitive decks, casual decks. If I get a new deck that I think looks interesting and fun, um, like we talked about, I always go to competitive. I don't ever play it in casual, even if it's lower size. Um, I try to get a few games in with it, and if if it doesn't feel like it's going to be able to hang with those decks that you see in TCO competitive, then I I kind of... I kind of relegate it. It's not really like I have to be able to stay in games for me to enjoy playing a deck. I have very few decks that are like um, middle tier that struggle to win that I just enjoy playing just because they're they're fun. I have very few decks like that. If I don't feel like I can hang in there in a competitive TCO game, then I'm not playing that deck very much. Um, I have a few decks that like used to be super favorites like there's a combo deck i have a battle fleet key abduction library access phase shift deck mm -hmm. and it's just it hasn't won it can't win lately like and to me then I, I just don't play it you know like it's um i cherish it it's a deck i've had for a very long time um but you know i, I don't bust it out every once in a while because i enjoy it because it's it's just lost too much that I, I don't enjoy it as much anymore um and so obviously as you can imagine there are a lot of decks that are higher than 70 that are generally not appropriate for casual, but I've played them and determined that they are not good enough for competitive. Mm -hmm. And so I just don't play them really anymore. Um, and I have a very small number of decks where I've actually um, gone to casual to play with them because they were not good enough for competitive, but they were not too high in SAS that I would get some complaints. So I, there are very few exceptions that I've played in casual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's a really interesting point. And I, for my for my games that are you know not sas cap games or not you know some other format that that encourages middling decks i'd say i, I probably have a similar experience um yeah i'm not looking to play random games in, in casual um with some of these lower powered decks i have some lower powered decks that are absolutely favorites um so uh, W. Peters uh, is an excellent uh, lower powered deck, which does not have this tag. Um, so 58 quad mother uh, library access. Uh, yes. Mamma mia. Mamma mia. You call it Mamma mia. <laughs> yeah. I would have known what you were talking about then. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I have played this deck in competitive. <laughs> um, and and won some won some cool games there with it, but um, not generally looking to run it out there on the regular. Um, but you know, love having opportunities to play it in Saskap, and probably one of the reasons why I enjoy Saskap as much as I do because it does provide a competitive environment where it's more reasonable to bring some of these uh, lower powered decks. Um, even if you know taking everything else about Saskap aside, um, I think that's something about the format that appeals to me as a as a competitive player. Yeah, we've had a whole episode on that too, so mm -hmm. people can check that one out. Um, hear about SASCAP, the pros and cons. Um, do you want to talk about money? Hmm. Was yeah, we, we, were, we were kind of debating whether or not to go there, so maybe we won't talk about uh, dollar figures or uh, or whatever whatever currency <laughs> you happen to uh, to use uh, the uh, the golden the golden uh, zwati. I don't know, <laughs> um, but. I think it's an interesting question, right? Uh, have you made any secondary market purchases for decks that you would consider for competitive play? And then have you done so uh, for decks that uh, you view it as more uh, casual uh, prospects? Uh, I think there has been one or two decks that I have purchased secondary market for a like highly competitive purpose. 
Um, one of them that I'm going to play later um, is a Dark Tidings deck that I just fell in love with immediately, and I had to have it, and it's been really fantastic for me. Um, but for the most part, like I got, I got a lot of enjoyment out of seeking out bargains in the secondary market. So for me, um, that's like another way for me to, you know, um, it's another way for me to be competitive. It's like, I want to be able to find something like you talked about the underdogs earlier. I want to be able to find something that others maybe don't value as much, but I can make it, I can make it work, you know, like, so Mm -hmm. I've had most of my secondary purchases are in that range. Um, which is generally like mid seventies at the most. Um, I've made some trades for like higher eighties decks, but nothing that's like been super competitive, hyper competitive. Um, so there is like an element though of this competitiveness to the secondary market because you see all these decks that are for sale and some of them don't have a price on them. And sometimes you'll see people offering like 500, $600 for them. Um, and you know, I I'm never I don't think I'm gonna be like that unless there's a very very specific reason I want something. If it's like both competitive and like unique in a way that like calls to me. Um, but there are lots of players out there who are willing to pay lots of money for those kind of competitive decks. And whether that's for um, like vault tours or just online leagues or you know whatever it is, um, who can say right now? But. Um, you uh, you have one up here right now, I believe, that you, you purchased in the secondary market, Brickblade. Is that correct? Yeah. So I, we're looking at actually my uh, my Hexad lineup for NKFL. Uh, so these are six decks. Um, I opened one of them. One of them. Yep. So Brickblade was a purchase. Lorien, Aslan, Combo Grief, Cell Warden, and Stealth Warper uh, were all decks that I did not open. Um, the one I did is Lighthouse here at the top. So five of these six, uh, were, um, were secondary market purchases. And I actually had, uh, uh, 10 decks that I was considering making a lineup for. And I think seven of the 10 were, uh, were purchases there. Yeah. I'm, uh, if I had a Hexad lineup, it would also include all decks that I bought in the secondary market, except for one. But I think that's largely because I just feel like I never open <laughs> anything good. Um, I'm at like 500 decks, and I think I've opened one that's actually like highly competitive. So um, I don't know if anyone else has a, a different ratio of that. Maybe that's normal. I don't know. It took me a very long time to find that one, though. Um, but, you know, how do you feel the secondary market influences this like competitive nature? Is it a reflection of it, or do you think that, um, you know, people just you know, they like what they like and they spend money on that? Or do you think it's it's more of a competitive reason? Ooh, definitely Did you both. buy these decks with the intention of, like, playing them in, a, in an event like that, right? Yes. Or did you buy these decks yeah. because they call to you? Uh, uh, so uh, I'd say I'd say both to an extent. Um, the majority the majority were to be played in a competitive setting. Um, so So the majority were like, hey, these are certainly all decks that I will enjoy playing, but will be vehicles to to doing well in events. Um, uh, Brickblade, actually, so one of my one of my DOK alerts is uh, is for three plus Kirby's and double punctuated equilibrium. It's kind of like one of the combos I've been chasing for like years, you know. And there are only a handful of them, maybe three currently uh, currently scanned. Um, uh, so, uh, so that was, that was more of like a, Hey, this is a very cool, very cool combo that, um, that I think also can be very strong. Um, uh, so, uh, that one kind of falls somewhere in the middle. And then the, uh, the only other one here that, uh, well, I'll be I'll also be very honest that I, I, uh, got Lorian because it reminded me a lot of Rector <laughs> uh, and saw how, how, how potent that can be. <laughs> um, and yeah, Combo Grief. Too. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, and then Combo Grief Cell Warden uh, kind of uh, kind of fits into both. So uh, there are actually, as of the last time I checked, exactly three Combo Grief decks in existence. Um, I now have two of them. And you if two of them. <laughs> two of them. So nice. I, I opened Hugh Slices the Gully, 
I managed to track down Cell Warden, and at that time, those were the only two. And then uh, in the era of Dark Tidings, the Athlete City, Kamo Grievely of the Athlete City, uh, was scanned. And um, I have... It's pretty solid, too. It's it's definitely a, definitely a fine deck. And I have messaged the owner uh, very politely, uh, without pressuring, of course, and said, hey, you know, if you ever want to move this deck, let me know. We'll see if we can work something out, but they're not interested. Yeah. You got a response then? I, I did get a response. I did get a response. They uh, I, they say, hey, yeah, this is one of one of my better D, DT decks. I'm going to hold on to it. Uh, thanks for thanks for the reaching out sort of thing. And hmm. I hope yeah. they know. Maybe they change your mind. Yeah, that if they ever change their Maybe mind. Maybe they're watching right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But someday I'll um, complete the uh, Combo Grief Triad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's pretty cool though to find two of the three already. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of that, that's like some, that's like a unique thing. That's like something that you might pay a little bit extra for now, even if that dark tidings deck isn't you know something that you're gonna play at a highly competitive level. Um, it's still you might pay a premium for something like that. Yeah, and uh, I guess while I have to continue outing myself as as a casual player, I guess I don't know. But the uh, <laughs> the uh, only uh, other other kind of uh, avenue that I've really pursued for secondary market uh, are Russell decks, right? So uh, I've, I've recently surpassed passed the threshold for the Russell Hexad. Um, and now we're kind of covering the SAS cap spectrum <laughs> for Russell decks. So from Russell the Perfect, which is just an incredible name, um, Russell the Magician, which is uh, my go-to adaptive deck at the moment. Uh, I really, really wanted Russell the Bartering to be a good adaptive deck, but I'm just not sure that it is. <laughs> um, and Russell the Just for JT Russell. Russell TJ, like how can you beat that? I don't know. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. But, yeah. um, I, I still can't find the Invisible. I, have you been able to find it yet? Huh, I, I, I moved over a box of... Uh, a box of decks and kind of saw this indentation that looks suspiciously like a deck. So I'm pretty sure uh, that's it, but I'm not, not hundred percent. It could be there. It could be there. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you ever see it, let me know. I'm very <laughs> interested to see it. You can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, all right, this is going to, I'm going to veer like into another money related topic. We're talking about the secondary market. Um, they recently announced at Keyforge Celebration that they would be bringing cash prizes to events next year. Um, and my first instinct was cool. That's pretty neat. You know, like make some money playing Keyforge. Like I'm down. Like I'm going to, I'm going to go for that. I'd love to play and have a chance at it. Um, but I definitely also saw some other responses that were not as enthusiastic about that. Um, and, you know, you were telling me before that, you know, you have some colleagues who um, have seen the kind of negativity that brings to other games. Um, so maybe this isn't all like a, you know, a wonderful thing to have, what do they say? Like $10,000 cash prizes at the vault tour or something like that. Yeah. And I'm not sure if this was, I, I don't, I don't want to quote the numbers, uh, but they were, they were impressive. My, my first reaction to the prizes that were being offered for some of these events that are upcoming was to be impressed, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, but yeah, I, I do know folks who I have played with who are very good players, who are you know very involved uh, with the game, you know, highly enfranchised, if you will, that were very disappointed to hear that cast prizes were going to be a prominent thing. And you know, I it wasn't my immediate reaction. I can appreciate the position, uh, appreciate the the feeling, and appreciate the concern. I am hopeful that this will be a, a good thing for the game. Um, you know, I kind of see, I kind of see the high level competitive play effectively as marketing for the game. Um, though I would love to love to partake in it as well. But, you know, if we're talking about being at a point in the game's life where bringing in new folks is good and necessary, I, I see this being a positive force. And I think yeah, I, I appreciate the concerns over, you know, oh, will there be an uptick in toxicity or, or what have you, or in this sort of cutthroat competitive uh, nature at events? Um, I hope not, but I think it's that's maybe maybe on the community to, uh, on the community a bit, um, to uh, yeah. uh, 
you know, build that build that kind of environment up. And I think if any community can do it, it's this one. Like this, mm -hmm. the KeyForge community is totally different than any other gaming community I've seen before. Um, just really, really good at sort of. Um, I don't want to use the word policing, but like of just keeping things like super friendly and um, a great environment, fostering a wonderful environment for for players. So I'm hopeful that it doesn't kind of devolve into the negativity. But like you were saying and you were hinting, like if it if it does attract more players to the game, then like you can still play this game in the corner, you know, where you're away from that that negativity and toxicity. Um, but if it gets to the point where it's like as big as Magic the Gathering, and you know, Magic the Gathering is probably the one example people think of with um, cash prizes and big events and Pro Tour and the negativity that might come along with that. Um, if we get to the point where we have that kind of negativity, like you said, like that means there's a lot of people playing this game, and um, you know, there's there's got to be a lot of good in that too. Um, not that I'm like I would accept that negativity and the toxicity if it came, but um, you know, yeah. You could maybe see a small silver lining in it, and that at least like the game is thriving if it's at that point. Um, yeah, this is how so, do you see? Yeah, this is an interesting question, and uh, and I'm wondering if if well, do you feel that that there that some amount of a toxic element is almost a byproduct of reaching a certain size? Like, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of give some context for this. The person I was talking about was t was thinking about magic and and looking at magic and saying oh gosh there's tons of toxicity in the mtg community uh i don't want keyforge to become like that and and drawing a connection to you know you know cash prizes and then that leading to a very cutthroat cutthroat nature and and fostering you know kind of kind of providing a place for this this toxic element to to grow um i played played mtg many years decades <laughs> um uh uh you know, almost three decades of playing MTG, um, and maybe it's just such a big game that that just wasn't my experience. So I, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. It's interesting. It's a really interesting topic or question, and not one that I had really, um, not the one that I had really a appreciated initially. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, but Magic is so pervasive now that you can avoid that toxicity. You can play at your local store. You can play. I'm sure you could play in like medium-sized competitive events that don't have that kind of pro tour negativity right like i'm not super familiar with with the way magic's competitive scene is right now um is that is that the case do you agree i have been been almost almost um exclusively a casual mtg player if that um for the last i don't know seven to ten years uh, <laughs> but you know at, at the point in time when i was you know quote unquote grinding the the Grand Prix circuit, uh, trying to get pro points. Um, I mean, you are traveling to events. There are definitely, there are definitely pockets within pockets of the player base. And uh, I don't know the, the team I was playing with at the time, like was a competitive team, but I think everybody, you know, was a good sport, had a very positive outlook on the game and very kind of like supportive of each other. Um, and I'd, I'd like to think that that's a thing that we could continue to have inside of Keyforge. And I think that's by and large the, the experience that folks will encounter across the board within the Keyforge community today. And I'd like to imagine that that would grow and then always be present, uh, even even if it didn't end up being kind of the 100%, uh, um, I don't know, uh, experience across the board and that we would, you know, try and promote those kind of good vibes uh, uh, if it yeah. were as well mm -hmm. yeah i mean um i wouldn't say no to a cash prize but still if i'm if i'm going to events i i want to play in live events again you know like i would travel for them without that cash prize and i would have that same competitive nature without that cash prize so to me it's almost like a bonus and that's why i think i don't really see it as a negative i'm like well, well i would have been doing this anyway so sure why not get paid for it too if i happen to do well um so you know I was surprised to hear that, that there was some, you know, um, apprehension about the idea, but it's a different perspective. And, you know, um, that's why I kind of was really eager to have this, this episode, because I'm realizing that there's many different types of competitive players out there and hearing from them and hearing the other opinions about, um, you know, some of the drawbacks to the stuff is pretty interesting to me to like learn more about other people in this way. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, w- I would say too that I, I don't know, strong opinions but loosely held. So I love love getting love getting folks with uh, different takes. So yeah, I don't know if you're coming at it from a different angle. Don't be shy uh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Right Do you want to play a competitive game now? Hmm. That sounds like we could play it in the casual view. <laughs> <laughs> we can go, go into beginner and play, bring our 90s, 90 SAS decks or something. Yeah. <laughs> we were there in our um, swindle event last week, and he set it up in, in beginner. So yeah. I, I played some beginner games last week. Yep. Yep. I don't know if I have ever played a game in beginner. That would be a checkbox to check. We can go there to play if it, if it makes you happy. Uh, no, I feel like com- I feel like casual would be more appropriate setting. But next week we can play on beginner. Okay. Well, maybe maybe one I'll... of these times we'll bring on an actual beginner, someone who's never played before, and that would be fun. Yeah. That would be fun. Hmm. Um. So I got a game for us up in in casual. Okay. Um, if anyone would like to watch, the password is sloppy. I think you guys probably know that by now. Um. So we were talking about what to play. I, I mentioned earlier that we might be streaming JDG's game. Um, they ended up playing earlier, so we had to play a game ourselves, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> Stuck I'm on us. quite a losing streak against you. Um, I think I've lost every game on stream against you the last like six weeks or so um, that I've played. Um, but I wanted to play a game tonight with a few of our decks that we consider competitive. And the way I pitched it to you was like, play a deck that you're stressed about losing with. Um, and I definitely like still feel this, like, especially it's not as bad as it was when the tracker was around, but when the tracker was around, it was tracking like your leaderboard and your record and there, you need to be above a certain point. Like I took that like more seriously <laughs> than I should have. Um, and even playing in just games like this that don't mean anything for a tournament or a league, I still get, you know, a bit anxious about it because I don't want to, um, I don't want to lose. And so that's what I was hoping we we pick some decks tonight um, that we're afraid to lose with and kind of show some some competitive nature here on stream. Nice. And I was between two decks. Um, uh, this deck, Lighthouse, uh, and Combo Grief Cell Warden. And I think I'm going to go with, uh, with Cell Warden, and I'll tell you why. Um, most of the other decks on my Hexad lineup um, have some bad matchups, right? Um, so they're, they're maybe trying to do one thing. There's, they're building to a pivotal turn where they're trying to swing the game. And if that happens, then they're in really good shape. And if it doesn't, or if they stumble across a deck that has their kryptonite, then you just lose. And maybe you don't feel bad because you're like, well, that was the kryptonite. So I'm going with a deck that is kind of, uh, um, you know, a rock, a rock of my, um, my Hexed lineup, it's sort of this all around utility belt type deck, um, and usually when I lose with it, I, I can look back on the game and say, I probably did something wrong here, um, as opposed to like my deck didn't fire, you know? Um, so this is why yeah. I'm going, going with this one. It looks very well-rounded. It is. I wish, uh, also if I had Jar against Anakin, pff, easy win. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I'm playing Anakin. Uh, it's the Dark Tidings deck. Um, it's the one I mentioned earlier that I did acquire on the secondary market it's like the one that i've um oh did you just click watch or join oh wrong one sorry i'm like the king of misclicks <laughs> right now <laughs> oh let's talk about the misclicks oh, no. um this is a really good topic though no and i'm not yeah. trying to rub salt in the wind. um Mm-mm. this was actually i thought a really interesting thing that we were talking about before the show that i wanted mm-hmm. to touch on um you played in a swindle match last week and mm-hmm. you had you were streaming it actually, so people can go back and watch this. Mm-hmm. And you played a control the week, and you said to yourself, "Okay, like they just called Sanctum. I know they have no Sanctum in hand because they just passed the turn without playing anything." And you said out loud on the stream, "Playing control the week, make them call Sanctum." But you clicked dis, and you didn't realize it until the next turn when they kept playing discards, and you're like, "What is happening right now?" <laughs> and I felt horrible. I was watching this happen in, in real time, watching it unfold, and you were able to laugh it off, and which kudos to you for being such a good sport <laughs> i would be so mad with myself if i did that um but I, you were telling me like the difference here is that like that was just a misclick it was a mistake you knew what you were doing it wasn't really like a tactical error mm-hmm. it was just like 
your brain turned off for a second and you clicked the wrong button. Um, and so there's like very different feelings for you, right? If you have like, if you have a turn where like, oh man, I really should have done something completely different. I don't know, you know, major misplay versus a brain fart like that where you just click the wrong house. Like they're different for you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was 100% still in like, I'm I'm calling disc for the turn and and like uh like Zach Zach saying I was talking about disc and my my brain just went oh disc click the button <laughs> and uh they took their turn started playing all these disc creatures and I was like wait a minute <laughs> is like is there a control the weak bug or something <laughs> but yeah 100% I mean uh, uh you know you've just got to you got to shrug it off for this one I mean if we were playing over the board I would have said sanctum um and we would have would have been not a thing but you know you click the wrong button it happens um if it was if i had been in that exact same position and thought to myself like this is the right right house to call here and then got punished for it um that would have been a moment to reflect and say okay yeah, i could have i could have chosen better here um i uh, uh well I don't know. Usually, like to be a little, little, little more humble, but I, I, I tend to think that I have a, uh, more, uh, more mental toughness than uh, technical prowess <laughs> in, uh, in a lot of, in a lot of cases. <laughs> Let me phrase it like that. But I'm, I'm very, very infrequently tilted. I don't know if I ever, ever get tilted. Um, this is my superpower. Uh, so, um, you know, I would have been tilted. <laughs> I've been tilted in. in some league events and tournaments like that where i just mm -hmm. did something so stupid um raising the tide is, is an example uh, or mm -hmm. not raising the tide um it was the swindle team event finals for season three it was the morai and it was game one i think and i was like super nervous patiently playing my first turn our first game and i said to myself like i was walking through everything i need to do in the turn before i started it I was like, yep, I'm going to play this and this and this. I'm going to raise the tide, and then I'm going to be great. And I did this and this and this, but I did not raise the tide. And I was so mad at myself. Like, I started pacing around the room, ended up losing the game, possibly because of that, which made it even worse. And, uh, yeah, like, that's kind of like, that's how I, I take it pretty pretty poorly. So <laughs> I'm glad it was you that did that and not me, because I would have been very upset with myself. Well, when we really want the good TV, we got to have my uh, my brother on the stream because then you'll get the like the cursing in Italian and the things thrown around. <laughs> It'll be good. <laughs> good TV for sure. <laughs> oh, I want to see that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Well, that was that was a good one. I'm glad we glad we talked to that one. Yeah, I had that was a great uh great match to illustrate, you know. I don't know. Uh uh, my my ability for misplays and misclicks. I don't know, <laughs> but the game before that uh, was definitely uh, definitely decided by my misplays as opposed to misclicks. And I now love having uh, f uh, the ability to reflect on some of those because I think I you know definitely learned some things about the deck, um, and then maybe I'm also getting a little more comfortable while playing while streaming. Um, I wonder if I I would have. As I, I'm thinking about this moment where I was trying to decide which house to play, and it's like, okay, I can do this six emperor tribute thing right now, um, or uh, or was it or was it the volcano? Hmm. But in any event, the there was a, there was this moment where I was like, oh, I have to kill this um, this reckless Rizzo. But it's like, no, if I if I took the logos turn and had more efficiency, then I just would not have had any amber for them to steal anyway. Um, and yeah. it was absolutely 100 percent the right the right play. And just didn't didn't take them take the time to think through it or or really uh, missed it, um, and that yeah. likely decided decided what could have been a, a good win um, for the other direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I've streamed some games before, <laughs> and I kind of I think it kind of helps me to talk through sometimes, mm -hmm. like if I'm if I'm talking to the stream and thinking like you know all right maybe I could do this for this this and this reason. Um, sometimes it helps me like work through it on my head whereas if i'm just playing like quietly not on stream or anything like that i might just breeze through a turn and not realize the mistake i was about to make it's a it's double-edged it's really easy to get into um it's really easy to get into this rhythm where you start just playing cards especially when you're kind of feel like you're in the zone but actually you're just playing cards and not thinking <laughs> um 
And I think... Especially if your opponent's playing very fast, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, blessing and curse. So Zoc Data Forge saying that, yeah, uh, can be... Uh, can be a blessing and a curse. I've definitely had moments where talking through a turn, uh, you're almost rubber duck debugging yourself, right? Like you're, uh, you're like, oh, actually that doesn't work. And as I talk through it, I realize it doesn't work for, for X, Y, Z reasons. But other times you can talk yourself into doing something and then feel like you've taken up too much time and now need to, now need to play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, speaking of playing, uh, oh, do you have a, do you have a sign off? for the uh folks in the podcast here uh no still don't very good <laughs> all right so i'm gonna choose my deck <laughs> one day i'm gonna surprise you and i'm gonna have something that is moderately clever <laughs> uh, one day we'll, we'll wait for that day we'll wait for that day um all right you're going first good luck have fun good luck have um, fun. So, uh, Combi Grieve, Anakim. Um, oh, I like this hand. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Well, Tempted. let's. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. We talked about this matchup a little bit before, and. Um, these are two decks, you know, we both really like. Um, there's one thing that I'm looking out for in particular in this matchup. So we'll see how that comes for me. And maybe it'll be a decision that you have to make. Um, <laughs> so let's start with Untamed. Just going to take those chains. Give me those chains. Raising mm -hmm. the tide. Deepwater Groon. Beach Day. Deepwater Groon. Check. Let's go. Check. Turn one. Check. Let's go I indeed. So I uh, I did mulligan a borrow hand, um, thinking mm. I would want it later to pressure, uh, to uh, have it threatening, uh, so you wouldn't be able to play Rooftop Lab. But now I'm like, oof, maybe taking that Ritual of Life would have just been better. Um, You're not wrong. Um, I didn't want to say that, but yeah, like borrow is a very tough card for me to see. It's the one I was thinking of when I was talking about that. Mm -hmm. And it's not always because of Rooftop Lab. Ritual of Life in this deck is brutal, and if, if that gets stolen instead, um, sometimes it's worse. Because mm -hmm. this is not really like a Feroctor deck, you know? Like, it has Feroctor in it, but to be very honest, the Logos house is the worst of any of the three houses in this deck, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I can I can deal with Ritual of Life a little bit, um, though seeing it now, staring at the, the Gruen, and possibly some shenanigans coming can be problematic. Um, uh, you know, I have some amount of purging to mitigate that, but um, boy, my deck would love, love to have a Ritual of Life. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to go Shadows, play Lucky Dice, <clears throat> Francis, and... Oh, do, 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 do. Yeah, I wasn't protecting wasn't protecting Rizzo anyway. So we'll do this. Let's see right. where that goes. <clears throat> quick key. I love it. Quick key for the quick draw. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, you got the Rizzo. We just talked about not having Amber with Rizzo out and calling Logos. So I feel like I have to do that. <laughs> Ooh, there's a rooftop lab. Wow. There. So I'm going to leave the decision up to you. When you get your borrow, what are you going to... What are you going to borrow? As luck would have it, I drew the borrow. And he's got the Rizzo. Maybe he's going to give me a turn. Wow. Wow. Oof, this is this is tricky. Tough call, right? Tough call. Hmm. Dang. Wow, that's really tough. That is really tough, quick draw. <laughs> well, we're going shadows. Uh, all doing, right. Doing that. Yeah, I mean, I wish you wouldn't have drawn it. I mean, 
stealing either one's good. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. let's let's make you discard a thing first. Maybe that'll that'll uh, you know hit another combo piece and uh, make things easy. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I feel like you're going to have a tough time setting up the combo with the pressure that I'm going to be putting on, and you don't have a ton of archiving. I am super tempted to just take that ritual of life and keep the pressure on, and, uh, you know, ritual of life plus the subtle auto feels pretty cool. Feels pretty cool. Not to doom. Mm-hmm. So first we're going to give you an amber. I'm going to fight in with Francis and take down this deep water Gruen. <clears throat> Good use of Francis. It's mm-hmm. always nice when you find some ways to do something like that. Um, this deck, I've done some similar things with um, a low tide and a deep water Gruen before. If I have five amber, give you one extra amber with the Gruen and then steal it with Ritual of Balance. Um, so there's some cool things. Uh, it's nice to see. Uh, nice to see you make good use of Francis there. Oof, and tough decision here, but I think I'm going to play out this bow, nothing, 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 and nine. I would say bow nothing, but I've heard people say bow nothing. I think if you're what Irish or Scottish, you say bony thing, bony thing. I don't know. <laughs> oh, it's a bony thing. Is it a bony thing? I t- I just realized that it's got to be a bony thing. It's got to be. Um. Okay, this is interesting. Uh, do I want to put something in discard now? That feels premature. And you have an awful lot of scoops and mugs. So I'm going to use this lucky dice and say no damage, please. No damage, please. Seems solid. Mm-hmm. And it's a check. good choice. Mm-hmm. Check indeed. All right, let's go back to Logos. Uh, let's play Base Shift for a Jackie Tar. Very cool. Um, so I can't damage you. If I reap, you're just going to steal it. But you're just going to steal anyway. So it's just all gas. Let's go. You can have the Tide as well. Cool. I'll make that red key. We are absolutely going shadows, right? Totally. Totally. Right back into shadows. Back into shadows. Stealing two um, with Reckless Rizzo seems pretty good. Seems very good. Reap it out with the other dudes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Playing that dark wave. Okay. And then using the ritual to bring back the bony thing. Ah, cool. Nice, very nice. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's a good play. It's a good turn. Um, can't take you off check, but I can do a little bit, but not much at all. Mm-hmm. Cool. Make that blue key. Oof. I'm fine seeing your shadows board gone there with that dark wave. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was expecting maybe maybe a little bit more board control coming back. Um, I had a little bit. Um, you killing the uh, the Jackie Tar was definitely um, taking away a lot of my creature control. This deck doesn't have a ton of creature control. 
Hmm. And now interesting. Torn between moving some cards or trying to attack your hand. Don't think it makes a ton of sense to go back into shadows. So let's call dis. We are going to draw a card with this enhanced drecker. Play in a couple artifacts, Essence Scale and Obsidian Forge, and then uh, Whale makes old Egad a sad Egad. Okay, cool. All right. Well, um, don't love giving you back your bow, but you're going to get him back anyway, probably. So mm -hmm. let's thin the herd. Raise the tide without taking some chains. The other ritual and the frog. And the frog. Excellent. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Hmm. Very rushy game. Yeah, Combo Grief has a fair number of pips in it, 18 pips, um, and can hit the efficiency right, but yeah, we both got out to scream and starts. I feel like if you had a turn or two with the Ritual of Life, you would have pulled very far ahead of very quickly. Um, I didn't have any good targets for it early. Um, I still haven't. Um, you know, like the Brend is one that you always look for. The Mookling is great with it. Um, just to always tax you, but I haven't been able to find those ones yet. All right, let's go Star Alliance here. Uh, we're going to take a look with Survey. Hmm. Discarding Red Alert. Playing a Kirby. And Kirby's going to wear a blast shielding to hit the key frog. With Kirby, we're going to play Infernus. And, uh, hmm. Let's take the Gruen and, hmm. Some decent targets here. Maybe the beach day. Beach day is maybe less worrisome. Oh, take the honors kesis. Good one. And then uh, less than impressive Anthony. <laughs> he is a sad Anthony. That's yeah. that for sure. All right. Um... Doing shadows here. Scoop. Not a great turn. But I can kill the Kirby at least. Oof, Hard Simpson. Interesting. Hmm. Can threaten here. Seems pretty good. So let's see one, two, three. Hmm. That puts me out of range for Ritual of Balance. Mm. Don't love leaving the frog. Are you uh, not subscribing to the Always Be Checking right now? ABC of Keyforge? <laughs> I'll, I will be checking. I will be checking, I think. I guess I have some options, though. Yeah, let's go dis. Even if I'm being goaded into it, I don't know. We'll see. 
Oh, so, yes, I, I want you to be checking me right now. Naturally. Very much. So we'll draw a card. Okay, that's that's cool. That's a cool card to be drawing. At least handles um, frog problems and makes things a little bit simpler. So now I can reap within furnace. Uh, I've played the dark minion. <clears throat> Going to put... Ah, you just drew, you drew the dark minion? Drew the dark minion. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that's very, very nice. Soul Keeper on the Dark Minion. Essence Scale is going to eat the Dark Minion. And Soul Keeper takes out Hard Simpson. I get to reap with Drekker and Steel there. And I'm not quite in range of Obsidian Forge, but we'll see where things go. Well, enough, because I have a 2-2-2 two, two, two hand, and that's the only thing I can do. Oof. Drew another 2-2-2. Two, two, two. Spoiler alert. <laughs> oh. oh, no. 2-2-2 two, two, two is not going to be a reckless uh, GBD combo. Um, let's see. I can fight in here. Take fight. Fight. Six. Seven. And is that still not quite? Make sure I'm not being silly and missing something in shadows. Think so, but <clears throat> we can go dis again. Play the brabble. Can I leave the hop number? Probably not. Probably not. So fight down the hobnobber. Reap. Use the essence scale um, to eat the infernus and reap with Drekker. And that leaves me one short. Ooh, one short, really? Wow, I guess I should have reaped with uh, the infernus there. I miscounted. Mm. Yeah, I think Sloppy. you could have had it. Um, I could have. <laughs> I thought I was yeah, one short. Um, Dang. I have I have one out here, and it's going to be with a draw pip. So let's see if the one draw pip can draw the one mookling. And it does not. So good game, sir. Good game. Um, I think I can win that one. But I had some really um, awkward draws after that nice opening hand. Mm -hmm. I had a 3-3 opening hand with both of my artifacts that I want. Um, obviously checked first turn, but then after that was just a lot of non-impactful cards like i just got the brend now um i never got the information exchange which was always going to do some damage i never saw any pieces of the feroctor combo except for a feroctor mm. um mookling i mentioned is like a really big one with the ritual of life never saw the mookling so mm -hmm. i think i can win this one um but you know my losing streak must continue <laughs> it's tradition you know <laughs> it is now um, it's because I, uh, I think it's because not tonight and I made fun of you for losing like the first two or three weeks we did this. <laughs> I'm paying for it. Uh -huh. You know, when, uh, when not tonight brings out the trash talk, that's when you have to be worried. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. But yeah, no, I, I would agree. This, uh, this felt like a, a soft showing from, from Anakin. Uh, there were a bunch of places in there where, you know, even one more scooped or one more mug would have made a huge difference. Um, yeah, uh, the lucky dice was really good for you that turn. Um, I was gonna definitely clear out the uh, the Rizzo if you didn't use the lucky dice. But super kicking myself on miscounting on that on that Obsidian Forge term that was that was poor showing. Um, Isn't it nice though that you can make those mistakes and you learn from it and you didn't lose anyway? Uh, would have would have been nice to have that walk off. Not gonna lie. <laughs>
get it recorded on stream. Yeah, yeah. the walk offs are always walk offs are always pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but no, interesting. Interesting. Uh, what do you, do you think about the steal of Ritual of Life over a rooftop lab? Um, I I mean, you, it worked you out. Chose, you chose right. Yeah, yeah, you definitely chose the right one. Um, like for the reasons you mentioned too. You know, like um, the rooftop. I needed to get my other pieces together for it to really make a difference. And I think it could have been a game if I found the Feroctor combo there near the end. Um, but the fact that I I didn't, you know, it's a lot of pieces to put together. And like you said, this deck doesn't have a ton of archiving. Um, so I think you definitely made the right call. Even if you didn't really get too much value out of the Ritual of Life, I think you got one thing back. But that threat of like getting the Infernus back now, getting a Kirby back, um, even getting Anthony back, there's like so many good options you have mm -hmm. um, for the Ritual. You, I think you made the right call for sure. Mm. Right on. Yeah, <clears throat> fun one. A fun one. We'll have to we'll have to play it again. I'll give you your, your yeah. chance for revenge for sure. Um, I demand a rematch one day. Absolutely. Absolutely. But cool. Fun one. All right. Well, um, that was a good one. Um, appreciate you guys watching in the chat. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm still curious, even after this episode, reach out to us. Um, let us know what you think about competitive nature in Keyforge. Um, very interested to hear more thoughts from other people on it. Absolutely. Uh, thanks all for coming out to the Sloppy Lab. Uh, we're signing off. Have yourselves a good evening, good morning, good whatever it happens to be.